Hello and welcome to Wrestling at Random. I'm Jeremy Deemer. And I am Adam Summers. You're in Season 5 of Wrestling at Random, where each and every week the theme is more wrestling than ever. Some 19,000 wrestling shows, TV shows, events have been dumped into the randomizer, upwards of 60,000 hours of professional wrestling. And we've had some, some different things on this season, a lot of, you know, Things you'd expect, WWF, WCW, some ECW, uh, some more off-the-beaten-path things. And then here, the randomizer did for, us, uh, did for us this week, I would call, the most solid of solids. It gave us a very eventful week of all Japan women's television from July 19th, 1992. Like you mentioned, we fire up the randomizer. It could choose anything from any time, any territory amongst the internet's wrestling content. And yeah, a lot of times it picks a nothing show. A lot of times it picks uh, a pretty brutal pay-per-view to get through. Uh, uh, or it'll a lot pick of a TV it... show that's a week before or a week after the really Loves eventful TV that. show. How often have we had that? Loves to do that. And then... Uh, we like to say the randomizer giveth and it taketh away. It does giveth. It does uh, give us some great... We've had some awesome shows, some shows we didn't know were going to be awesome. We've learned about wrestlers we didn't know we loved until we saw them here on the show. So it does do us a solid and give us great shows as well. Here, we're going to see an episode of All Japan Women's Television. It aired July 19th, 1992. And... Uh, We'll get into the show itself. Uh, what a what a what a great show to pick. This was this was just randomly on television. This show was awesome. Like this is a tremendous episode of television. I'm so excited to to tell everybody about it. And as of the time of this recording, you can watch it for yourself. It's available on YouTube as of the time of this recording. Yeah, this is by the standards of a, of a weekly television show. Very eventful. Uh, this is at an arena that still exists to this day, Oda Ward Gymnasium. Uh, several major promotions still run there. New Japan has their anniversary show every uh, every year, but there are many titles on the line. There are top stars on the line. If you're a fan of this era of early uh, to mid-90s All Japan women, pretty much uh, for the most part, almost everyone you would expect would be on this show. I'm pulling it up right now. So this show took place. It actually happened July 15th uh, and then aired July 19th. 2,300 people. So not sold out. Not uh, sold out. No. But a good crowd for uh, a six match show, uh, several of which we would have people wrestling uh, multiple times. Not too many, but there are a few people on the show that wrestle multiple times. And yeah, just a... Uh, uh, a, a hell of a show. Very excited to get into it. It also works out well. If you listen in linear fashion, both on our free feed and on the bonus feed, uh, we just had some all Japan women uh, content in the, uh, in the form of a curated list on one particular wrestler. So let's talk about all Japan women real quick. For those unfamiliar, uh, the company was founded in 1968. The 1980s were the boom period, led by the popularity of the Crush Gals, taking on Dump Matsumoto's group, and continued into the 90s, which was also a hot period for women's wrestling as additional Joshi promotions started up and uh, talent remained at an all-time high level. As the promotion started to lose stars in the late 90s to other promotions, they briefly lost their television time slot in 1997. They regained their time slot in 1998 until they lost it again in 2002. In 2005, after 37 years, the promotion officially closed up shop and went out of business. But man, uh, after watching this show, uh, after watching the the over in the bonus feed, we've we've had a ton of uh, all Japan women and the uh, Minami Toyota Toshio Yamada hair match we had over there, which is one of the most Classic. incredible matches of all time. Yeah, anytime we get it, I'm excited, and we're gonna get into it right now. Uh, you mentioned uh, non sold out 2,300 fans. Uh, the show starts. We get the opening graphics. 
we get some folks discussing something to open the show, probably telling yep. us what we're going to see. The opening graphic, the opening intro almost reminds me more of like a, an 80s territory style open than a Japanese wrestling TV open. Very cool, though. And so we get the panel uh, discussing what we're about to see. And then we uh, we go to some commercials. We've got commercials here, Japanese early 90s commercials, uh, including a sumo wrestler dancing around and I believe inventing the dab. There's it's a series of like rapid fire weird Japanese commercials. Like I can't yeah. even recap them because it's just like bang bang bang. I'm like I don't know what that was. I don't know what just happened and it just keeps on moving. We'll we'll talk about some that stood out as we review the rest of this show. Uh our opening contest is uh so all right. So our opening contest is for the Japanese tag team title. So this is like a night of champions, basically. Yeah, so we're not, uh, this isn't one of those things where like, we're just calling it the Japanese tag titles. That's what it is listed as. <laughs> yes, uh, the Japanese tag title. So this is a night of champions. Uh, every match has a title on the line here. The challengers in this match, Debbie Malenko and Mima Shimoda. Yes, challenging. Mima Shimoda, who if you're not overly familiar with Japanese women's wrestling, but you're familiar with modern New Japan, you will see her on shows working backstage. Uh, at least she had been for many years. Uh, there are some some very memorable moments during backstage promos between Jay White and Mima Shimoda. Uh, but here she is as a young wrestler teaming with Debbie Malenko to challenge the champions, uh, Takako Inoue, and a young Mariko Yoshida, who it always throws me off to see her in the early 90s doing high flying stuff because my memories of, of Mariko Yoshida are more from the late nineties into the early two thousands uh, where she's got the black and red uh, gear with the, the spider and spider web motif. And she's just an absolute magician in terms of mat work. What a transformation stylistically uh, in her uh, called later years of her career as compared to here where she's just a hundred miles an hour high flyer. Yeah. Bell rings and we're going. And uh, we get stereo topes from Yoshida and Inoue. From a very Dep cool camera shot. We talk about like how things in Japan sometimes feel five, ten years ahead. You always hear Terry Funk talk <laughs> about that. Yes. Are we sure this isn't a drone shot to start this and to start the other matches? It's such a great sweeping crane camera shot of these stereo topes from the challengers on either side of the ring. Debbie Malenko outside getting her ankle checked out. She's struggling to put weight on it. She continues to wrestle the match. It breaks down. Shimoda hits Yoshida with a backdrop driver right on her head off the second turnbuckle. This got a long two count. Yes, yeah, second rope back suplex that, yeah, totally turned into a backdrop driver, whether it was meant to be or not. <laughs> Yoshida hits a springboard crossbody off the middle rope to the floor. Lots of pin attempts getting broken up. Inoue hits Malenko with a top rope butterfly suplex. Yoshida runs up to the top turnbuckle, turns in midair to land a splash, and she gets the pin. Still tag team champions. Hot, quick opener. Yeah, all action opener. Again, for me, the, the highlight was seeing uh, Marika, uh, Marika Yoshida just doing these sorts of things early on in her career. We also see, like, in this match, staples of what we'll see throughout the rest of the show, a lot of, ru like, quick run-up in the corner and springing back off for top rope moves, uh, a lot of dives, a lot of moves off Irish whips, and just break neck pace here to start off. Yeah, let's remind uh, ourselves where the wrestling world is in 1992 midsummer 1992 uh most folks aren't at this pace especially women's pro wrestling you've never seen anything like it in the u.s no and we'll see with with terry power later on this card uh the difference in terms of like just training and you know the competition that you work with in america as a as a woman in the early 90s versus at the level that women were at in Japan. So we go we go from this match, this tag title match to start, and then the next match fe features again Mariko Yoshida, this time uh, in a title defense of her All Japan Women's Championship, taking on one of those names that I remember from the magazine, Sakie Hasegawa, who would come in and do 
uh, some matches, I believe, for LPWA in the United States. It was one of those names you would see from time to time in the magazines. Um, but, you know, as a kid, you didn't actually see. So, it'd be, you know, it's one of those feels interesting to see them actually wrestle a match. Uh, and here she is challenging Mariko Yoshida again for the All Japan Women's Championship. So they're doing their introductions. Streamers everywhere in the ring. You know, similar, you probably saw it uh, in, in Ring of Honor and some other uh, Japanese promotions where people throw the streamers into the ring. There are streamers everywhere at, during the introductions, and Hasegawa jumps her during the introduction. So streamers are still in the ring. There's seconds filling the ring, and, uh, and Hasegawa is on the attack. Yeah, we're getting streamer brawling. The seconds are filling the ring, not only trying to break them up, but trying to just pull this this insane amount of streamers out of the ring so they can actually wrestle. Hasegawa is just ragdolling Yoshida while the streamers are, are still in the mix. Uh, she hits a, a crazy jump spin kick, which we'll see more of as the match goes on. Uh, Hasegawa has a wrist lock, and Yoshida kind of uh, foreshadowing what her style will be later on. It's this really cool leg scissors takedown that is basically exactly what we see Rob Van Dam use uh, a few years later in a modern times where he scissors the legs, jumps through, and turns it into a pinning combination. As we've talked about on the bonus feed a lot when we've had these All Japan women's shows come up, the theme when you watch is all your favorite moves – actually got invented by women in all Japan women 10 years before you saw them in the U S uh, we saw that on the bonus feed with the, uh, the jackhammer and its variation, the Jack breaker or the backhammer. Uh, Thank you, Jackie and, Sato. Yes, Jackie Sato. And we see that again here uh, at the start of this match. Yeah. And that's no exaggeration. Like the innovation of moves and offense and defense and counters and grappling like the innovation for, for when going all the way back to the late 70s through the 80s into the 90s these moves every time are 10 years ahead of uh where everybody else was incredibly impressive and it's always, and we'll see, we see it in this match, we see it in some of the other matches on this show. It's such an interesting mix that you almost don't get in any other promotion because you've got all these moves which feel state of the art even through 2024 eyes, but they're done through the lens of matches that are much more rugged and unstructured and have room for, for mistakes that actually make the match better. Uh, there, there's a real sense of urgency that you don't necessarily see in modern day matches that have the same state of the art moves. It's just a very different and singularly unique style, particularly for the time period and almost even more wild watching it now than it probably was back then. Hasegawa misses a crossbody. Yoshida kicks her out to the floor. She runs up the turnbuckles, does a huge dive onto Hasegawa outside. Back inside, Yoshida throws like five drop kicks, including a shotgun drop kick off the middle rope, a top yeah. rope shotgun drop kick. Put that, uh, put that in your pocket for later. Uh, clearly influenced by Minami Toyota, who we see take that to even uh, more of a level. That's like we were talking about stylistically, the, the 70s into the 80s, even into the early 90s, you'd see what? A lot of move, 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 like the same move done three or four times in a row. We see that happening here, but it's at the highest speed possible with high flying stuff rather than like a side headlock takeover. Sunset flip gets a, a near fall. We get a top rope cross body by Yoshida. Hasegawa rolls through and gets a long two count for a great near fall. Hasegawa with spin kicks to the face. She oh, hits a couple geez. off the middle turnbuckle. Yeah, jump spin kicks to the face off the middle turnbuckle. Like, think Great Muda's jump spin kick or uh, maybe even more accurately, Ultimo Dragon's jump spin kick. But instead of hitting the chest, hitting the face and then being off the top rope or off the second rope a couple times. Yoshida's bleeding from the mouth from these kicks. Hasegawa kicks her in the face again and gets the pin. I was like, wow, we've got a new champion. It's Hasegawa. I was completely shocked by this finish. This finish was awesome. Like you said, Yoshida's mouth is busted open. She uh, hits an Irish whip, but Hasegawa hits a counter version this time of that jump spin kick directly to the bloody mouth and gets the pin straight off of that. I was not, as we were watching this, expecting that to be the finish. I was not expecting that to be the result. 
uh, no, but it great was awesome. match for for uh, <laughs> sort of the time period, the amount of time they had, the fact that Yoshida had just wrestled a, a no uh, you know no breaks at all sort of uh, balls to the wall type of match right before that. Uh, really cool match, cool finish, and then we get a very shy, very emotional Saki Hasegawa uh, talking with the panel backstage before we go to commercial. There's a commercial where a guy in a suit is yelling at someone who's sitting behind a desk in an office setting. And then from off camera, someone throws this man a bucket. Then it cuts to a bottle of pills. I have no idea what this commercial was for. <laughs> it seemed like it was maybe for some sort of aspirin, but I don't know what this man was trying to accomplish or what his counterpart was trying to accomplish by throwing him a bucket. It did not appear as though he was going to throw up. Uh, we then go from there to a ridiculous hair store rest, uh, restoration product commercial that apparently not only if you take this, it not only restores your hair, but it makes you a tennis pro. Uh, we get I a, have no idea what's happening in these commercials. <laughs> a Japanese language trailer for the movie Howard's End. And then we get a commercial for a Japanese soap opera of some sort before coming back to the ring. We go back to the ring where... Uh, the All Pacific title is on the line. The challenger, Terry Power, who we've seen on previous episodes we've reviewed in the bonus feed. You you would know her most likely as Tori, not Tori Wilson, but other Tori in the WWE, WWF. Kane uh, slash was- Xbox story. The Kane Xbox story, Tori. That is the one. Here she's Terry Power. And uh, challenging Kyoko Inoue, she's the champion who comes out to Panama by Van Halen is a great theme song. I recognize the song, but I knew right away that uh, uh, that you would know it. Kyoko Inoue still active in 2024. Uh, she's had matches in five different promotions. Um, just in pro wrestling, Diana alone has already had six matches in the first three months of 2024 if you're listening in linear fashion so still a very active wrestler still wears the same uh basic gear with the uh almost sting style face paint red and yellow uh the, the sort of full length body suit that is red and yellow with fringe uh and she like you said she is taking on terry power who i think most people would know her from this podcast as eliminating herself from the non-royal rumble <laughs> Yes, uh, that we reviewed in the uh, in the bonus feed. One of the Patreon.com. best over the top rope bumps you've ever seen in your life. We howled with laughter. We, we still will reference that to each other anytime someone goes over the top rope on their own. We we're immediately texting each other, Terry Power. Oh yeah, that Iron Savages uh, viral moment in 2024. 100 <laughs> percent a Terry Power moment. Terry Power also. <laughs> I referenced earlier Sake Hasegawa, name you see in the magazines. Terry Power, prior to her joining WWE, WWF as Tori, she was a magazine wrestler. She was one of those people that you never saw on TV, but got built up like crazy in the after magazines. I think of like a, a Billy Black as another example of that. It's like a person you never saw, but just they made seem like a superstar. Patreon.com slash wrestling at random is where you can access that bonus content or by hitting the subscribe button in your Apple podcast feed as well. Uh, This match had a much slower and deliberate pace compared to the craziness we've seen in the earlier matches on this show. Power backdropped over the top rope, holds on, uses her legs to head scissors and take Inoue over the top to the floor. Yeah, that was her most impressive moment on the match. The Ricky Steamboat style skinning the cat into a head scissors. Like she's, again, by the standards of early 90s American women's wrestlers, she's totally fine. But it's just like you can see Kyoko Inoue wrestling down to the pace that Terry Power can wrestle. Um, Everything that Terry Power does is very... Uh, robotic in motion. Part of it is that she's just, she's a bodybuilder. She's huge, but like there's no fluidity. The clotheslines look awful. Uh, again, like by the standards of early '90s, she's more than acceptable as an American women's wrestler. But seeing her in the deep end here against someone as great as Inoue was, like you can you can see the difference. Power actually runs and jumps over the top rope to the apron, and that I immediately had flashbacks to her eliminating herself. <laughs> I was laughing so, so hard. 
Uh, she comes with a dive off the apron, but in a way moves and power just wipes out one of the seconds at ringside. Back inside, in a way comes off the top with what could be only be described as like a Darby Allen-esque coffin drop. <laughs> I was just going to say that she both invented the Darby Allen coffin splash to the floor of the standing opponent and then goes for and misses a Darby Allen coffin drop, a backsplash off the top, not senton style where you're facing your no. opponent where you jump back like trust fall style, 1992. <laughs> She misses and hit the mat hard, and this is a hard ring. There is not a ton of give on this ring. Yeah, if you've never seen All Japan Women, really any of the Joshi promotions of this time period, like it has more give than the WWF rings or the Mexico rings of this time period, but the look of it is like concrete with a nice pretty mat over it. Like It looks horrendous to take bumps on. Power hits a Rana and gets a two count. She tries a second one, but gets power bombed. In a way, puts power on her shoulder, like Canadian backbreaker position, and then drops to her ass, slamming her all the way down to the mat. Kyoko In a way gets the pin. Yep, she gets the. Uh, she had to muscle her up, but it's basically the Splash Mountain, the the Conan, the Eddie Guerrero, uh, razor's edge into a sit out power bomb type of move. Gets the win. Nothing special, but totally fine for what it was. Uh, we'll we'll see much better stuff uh, moving forward on the show. But first, we have more commercials. Uh, not really anything all that noteworthy on these commercials, but we come back. And then, oh, my God, for the CMLL women's title, it's Akira Hokuto versus Bull Nakano. This is insane. So beforehand, before we get to this, when we came back from commercials, we did get to see women were drawing numbers for their Grand Prix tournament here. They yes. were uh, doing the uh, the bracketing for that. Uh, that's a big deal for All Japan women. That's a, a, a very important tournament. And yeah, we go to the ring and... Uh, this is the CMLL, like that. Yes, Mexico's title. Like they, uh, the these women, uh, a few of them were doing tours in CMLL, and Bull Nakano is the CMLL women's champion here. Uh, she comes out to Judas Priest, uh, the Hellion Electric Eye, and uh, yeah, her challenger is Akira Hokuto, and I'm gonna say it right here, no one is cooler than Akira Hokuto. Other She's than, the coolest looking wrestler ever. Come on. Other than Bull Nakano. Like, <laughs> seriously, these are the two most badass, I'm not even going to say women, they the are. two most badass wrestlers in my, like, almost 40 years of watching pro wrestling. And we, we are presented with the two of them face-to-face -face here in 1992. I cannot believe our luck uh, that this was going to be one of the two main events here of the show. Yes, this the, both of them have off the charts superstar looks, oh, and charisma. watching them standing in this ring, yeah, I, like th this is incredible. And I am just the biggest Akira Hokuto fan. I could watch her drop people on their heads all day. She is so cool. Bull Nakano is getting a ton of. Uh, is getting a ton of love right now in 2024 as she's going to be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame as part of their WrestleMania weekend. And so uh, there's a ton of Bull Nakano clips going around the internet yes. as of uh, 2024. So uh, it's always great to see her and we get to see her in a match here. Uh, we've, we've talked about, we've seen her in the past in a lot of stuff. And yeah, she's always uh, part of the chaos, Part of the the the, the scary uh, uh, overpowering wrestler, just just such a cool presentation. Her hair standing straight up and blue and uh, like paint spider on her web face. style face paint, just such really a cool. such an intimidating look and such a you know totally different. But like I remember as a kid seeing her, whether it be seeing her in the magazine when we saw her in the WWF in the mid nineties, like had that same vibe to me as Vader where it was just like you knew you were seeing something singularly unique yes. and scary in a really cool way in a very this is professional wrestling uh, style. We get to start this match, a wide sweeping camera shot again from this crane or 
drone before drones existed. As to start this match, Akira Hokuto runs up to uh, Bull Nakano, grabs her from behind, and hits two backdrop drivers and then a double arm DDT, but only gets a one count uh, as she follows it up with stomps and kicks. A nasty, ripping reverse chin lock. Uh, all, all that right to start with Akira Hokuto. Yeah, Hokuto dropping her on her head repeatedly. This was uh, to start the match. And then uh, Nakano fights back, knocks Hokuto to the outside. Nakano does a tope suicida, if you can believe it, at her size. Not only a tope can... suicida, the one we love more than any here yes. on the podcast, the Owen Hart style cross body tope suicida. She continues to beat on Hokuto around ringside. Back inside, Nakano to the top hits her awesome top rope leg drop for a long two count and an awesome great near fall here. And I this love the clip leg of... drop is like we always talk about Bobby Eaton's Alabama Jam and how yes. when you watch it on slow motion, there's a great slow motion gifts of like in real time, it looks like he kills the dude. And you see, I think it's a gift of him hitting on Arn Anderson. And like in actuality, frame by frame, there is not a a, a part of his leg, a piece of material on his tights that even make any contact with Arn Anderson's face. But it looks deadly. Here, Bull Nakano's top up leg drop is the most legitimately devastating looking move <laughs> of all time. She yes. kills her opponents with it. I love it. <laughs> this is great. I love the clip of her doing that leg drop off the top of the cage oh my gosh if you watch that she comes off the top of a cage and does this leg drop all cage like a cody rhodes wardlow height cage yes absolutely terrifying and it looks like i mean it 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 looked like it hurt her just as bad as it hurts her opponent like it's incredible but it does look like it hurt her as bad as she it hurts her opponent. But she also, again, being the coolest mf in the room, she hits this top of the cage leg drop, bounces on impact. Bounces. Bounces so high that she lands on her feet off of the bounce. It does not even look real, but it is. No, no, it's absolutely. If you haven't seen it, go go look that up. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, this was an incredible leg drop, too, off the top here. This was tremendous. Nakano on the turnbuckles again, and she's being stopped by one of the seconds. There's another one in the ring. Yeah, the Mima referee Sh- is trying to stop her. It's Mima Shimoda from earlier on is up trying to stop Bull Nakano. Nakano throws her off once, but she runs back up, tries to stop her. Like I said, we have another person in the ring. Uh, the doctor comes in, who I believe may be Dr. Hayashi, the doctor that is ringside at New Japan shows, even in modern times. I believe that's the referee here. He waves it off. We get a doctor stop as he grabs the mic and explains what happened. Uh, so this match, it only goes, let's see here. I'm on cage 11 match. minutes. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's 1158. It is awesome as it happens, but it, it only goes 1158. And it is uh, Bull Nakano winning via doctor stoppage. Yeah, I immediately, my notes say, boo, I want more of this now. I want more. Like, this was this was awesome for the 11 minutes we got, but it's one of those where it felt like I only got three minutes and I wanted more action. Yeah, and I feel like it wasn't I quite... these two. It wasn't quite three minutes, but this was definitely edited down for TV, probably to four or five minutes. Um, but yeah, it just it left you wanting more, which I assume was the idea if this was not a legitimate injury. Uh, we get some post-match... Uh, Trash talking from Bull Nakano toward uh, Akira Hokuto before Bull Nakano leaves. She's uh, Bull Nakano is wearing her Megadeth shirt, which yes. uh, I do love because her and I had that in common in 1992. I also had a Megadeth shirt. I had a Megadeth denim jacket as well. I feel like there is a, a previous episode of this podcast where Bull Nakano had a match. Yes, where she was wearing a different shirt that you a also different Megadeth owned. shirt. Yeah, yeah, the- <laughs> you guys were spirit animals. <laughs> We see a commercial for a samurai movie that looks awesome. I want to see that. Someone should request that over in the bonus feed for us to review. We also get a commercial, the second one of the show for the, or this is the first of two for the visual queen of the year, 1992, which I assume if you listen to our bonus feed and you heard about one of the judges in 1988 for Ric Flair versus Sting, that being pet of the year, Patty Mullen, I assume this is something similar, only the Japanese version. And we go back to the show for our main event. 
Hey, I hold on. I'm a little too excited about this commercial we got for the whatever this festival of old race cars was in Japan. <laughs> I want to go to that. The WWWA tag team titles are on the line. Two out of three falls. The challengers is the team of Aja Kong and a surprise mystery partner taking on the champions. The team of uh, Toshio Yamada and Manami Toyota, who we love Manami Toyota on this podcast. We love Yamada as well. We love Aja Kong. I, I'm, I'm into this. I'm super excited. Aja Kong comes out first, and then she calls out the person to be her tag team partner, and it's Kyoko Inoue coming yes. out to be her surprise tag team partner who we saw defeat Terry Power earlier on. They are the challengers here in this two out of three fall match. And we have before the belly of it rings, uh, Inoue wants to, uh, we've got Aja Kong being the voice of reason, trying to keep Inoue from getting at uh, Toyota and Yama, uh, and Yama. Toyota starts the match with a drop kick to Kong and Inoue, and they immediately start double teaming her. Yamada Tags in, starts throwing kicks, and the champs are in control. Yeah, that's this it. Is... If you haven't seen Yamada before, like the theme with her is she is an incredible kicker. She is basically, yes. uh, she basically is wearing great Sasuke style gear, uh, doing moves that would all be ripped off by Loki seven or eight years later. So this is a great pace early. Oh, uh, they are moving. Pace. We got insane pace with like Minami Toyota doing wild lucha flying arm drags off the top rope. She hits like a victory, like a short arm scissors version of a victory roll. Just wild stuff. We've talked about before. Minami Toyota is the most ambitious wrestler I've ever seen in that she's capable of doing insane stuff on just, just uh, from full stop. But then she will try anything. And she has no fear of messing stuff up. Like the only comp, and it's to a greater degree, but the only comp I can make is Sabu in that absolute fearlessness of just trying the highest degree of difficulty stuff. And if it doesn't work, she doesn't care. She'll just move on to the next thing. She's running around throwing a ton of drop kicks, a flying shoulder block off the top for a two count, a series of submission attempts by Toyota on Inoue. Toyota's in with Kong, and Kong with a series of big elbow drops. She gets a two count. Toyota doesn't kick out. She bridges to stop the count, which I always love with these All Japan Women shows. One of your favorite things I know. One of the other things we always, we t again, talk about the influence that these women had. Uh, we've talked before w when we've done shows about All Japan Women, you know, Dave Meltzer going to these shows and most male wrestlers that were in Japan at the time saying, why are you going, not wanting to go with him? Uh, but Lightning Kid, Sean Waltman, would go uh, with Dave Meltzer to some of these shows. And there's a specific corner spot uh, with Yamada hitting a series of kicks and then a jump spin kick to the face that is 100% something that the Lightning Kid ripped off of and would do, even if you're listening in linear fashion to last week's show, that episode of WWF Superstars, we see that very same combination from the one, two, three kid in a match against Chris Hammer. Package pile driver by Kong. Again. <laughs> in 1992. 1992, a package pile driver. You would not see that anywhere in North America until what, like the mid to late 2000s with Kevin Steen. Here in 1992, we have that as a move and not even the final finish of the match here. Uh, from from Aja Kong. Just insane. Toyota tries a couple submissions, but Kong overpowers her. Toyota does hit a German suplex for two. This was really impressive looking, someone the size of, of Kong and the size of uh, uh, Toyota. Inoue's in and gets caught in Toyota's rolling cradle, which is always a fun move. Yeah, she kept going for it against Aja Kong earlier on, like in the same sequence. She'd go for it. It starts from a, an abdominal stretch position into the rolling cradle, and Kong just immediately threw her off three or four times. So the second Inoue was in, she seized her moment and got it. Inoue tries to run up the corner but slips. They recover with her hitting a springboard back elbow. 
this was awesome because we talked what's one of our biggest pet peeves on this show repeated spots when something goes wrong and you immediately do the same spot again nothing takes me out of a match more and just makes you like oh we're just hitting spots in our dance routine here they blow past it and said they improvise with uh in a way hitting this rebounding double back elbow off the middle ropes that has basically the same effect as the spot they were going to do but it's not a repeat it doesn't take you out of the match kong and toyota are on the top toyota comes off with a sunset flip attempt doesn't work kong drops down with a bonsai drop dare yes. i say a northern exposure Yes, a counter northern exposure here. Champs both put Kong on the top. Inoue pulls Yamada outside. Kong knocks Toyota down to the mat. Inoue comes off the top, hitting Toyota with a falling back elbow drop. And Kong comes off the adjacent top rope with a flying elbow of her own <sighs> and gets the pin. The challengers win the first fall. This top rope elbow drop by Aja Kong is brutal in the best way. The only thing I can compare it to is if you imagine uh, the Abdullah Butcher running elbow drop, you know, before he was older and he couldn't run with it, this is that impactful but off the top rope. We go to the second fall. It starts with just a brutal slap fight. <laughs> and then the champs try to double team Kong, but Kong hits a cross body on both Toyota and Yamada. Yeah, a running double cross body by Aja Kong. This is like Stan Hansen cross body level uh, greatness here. In a way, with a giant swing to Toyota. In a way, runs up but loses her footing again and gets cut off by Toyota. Yeah, we should note this is July in Japan. These buildings, modern days, a lot of these buildings don't have air conditioning. I guarantee you, uh, Oda Ward Gymnasium did not have no. air conditioning in 1995. <laughs> Everyone is sweating profusely. Uh, I'm sure the ropes are wet, and I think that plays, you know, played a big factor in, in a way several times falling. All four are fighting outside until Toyota wipes everyone out with an acai moonsault. This is the most wild, unhinged acai moonsault you have ever yes. seen. Again, Toyota does not care. She is going to try stuff. She may not know until halfway through the execution of the move if it's something she should have tried, but she does not care. She will do it. It works out well here. Just delightfully chaotic. We get a double backdrop driver on Inouye and then the Ocean Cyclone Suplex by Toyota, and she gets the pin for the second fall. God, I love that move, and so few people. That move is so cool. Do yeah. it or do it well, but Minami Toyota's Japanese Ocean Cyclone Suplex hold, where she has you up in the electric chair position, has the arms crossed in front, and then slowly and beautifully bridges back into both a suplex and a pinning combination at the same time. Just a gorgeous move. We go to the third and deciding fall. Toyota running wild with drop kicks again. She is warp speed. You think modern times of, you know, Azumi or Starlight Kid or uh, May Sarah or May Saruga, anyone like that. Minami Toyota is faster than all of them combined here. Top second row drop kicks from every corner, from each corner consecutively. The fourth one directly to the face goes for the cover, but Aja Kong is in with her trademark small trash can to make the save. Yeah, just to put a bow on that, like this is the third fall of this match, and she's working at this speed. This like isn't like the minutes opener. In. This match yes. goes 36 minutes. Again, in what I'm sure is extreme heat in this building. Yeah, you're right. Kong hits her with that metal box, and uh, and then Kong throws Toyota into the crowd. They're fighting amongst the people. Kong and Yamada are deep in the arena fighting. Kong's throwing rows of chairs at her. Literal Chaos. rows. She she throws a chair at her, and then the, the next thing you see is an entire connected <laughs> row of chairs hurtling through the air at Yamada. In the ring, Toyota is taking on both Kong and Inoue. Toyota tries a top rope crossbody. She's caught and slammed for a two count. Yamada's back on the apron now. Toyota goes for a sunset flip. Kong tries to drop down ass first again, but Toyota avoids it this time and tags in Yamada. She runs wild with kicks. She puts a stretch muffler on Kong. She pop 
powers out and tags Inoue in. Yamada running wild with kicks to her as well. Yeah, these kicks are, they're short. Like you think of, you know, like a, a, a Shinya Hashimoto or a Katsuhiko Nakajima where like the, they're fast with these big wind-up heavy kicks. Hers are almost all from like, like the whip is from the knees down. It's a very different style of kick, but it looks great. Kong from the outside grabs Yamada. Inoue accidentally runs into her partner, knocking Kong off the apron. This sequence was awesome. Top Toyota's hits a top rope drop kick to Inoue. She staggers back into Yamada, who tries to pick her up for like a German suplex, but Inoue rolls through and rolls Yamada up. It looks like Toyota will easily make the save and break up the pin. But Kong from the outside grabs the leg of Toyota. You see her go down, and Yamada has to kick out. And so this was a ridiculously awesome near fall. The whole place, when they saw Toyota was actually grabbed, gasped that, she, that uh, they thought Yamada it was it had for to sure. kick out. Yep, it's, this it's, was so cool. One of the best, most well-constructed, and most well-executed near falls I've ever seen And again, you're this late into the match. You do something that intricate in a way that comes off perfectly and does not come off overly choreographed. Just like, again, you, I I can't recall in like the last couple of years, modern times, seeing a better near fall than this. No. And you're playing off the trope that like, well, she's in the ring. She's just going to break up the the pin. We're just, we're used to seeing so many pins be broken up. We've seen it in this uh, match already several times. Exactly. And to watch, just the whole crowd reaction when Toyota was it because they're they're thinking oh my Yamada doesn't even need, doesn't even need to kick out because she, the yeah. thing's going to be broken up and then she has to at the last second kick out when she realized she wasn't going to be uh, saved. This was just th- this sequence was so cool. I rewound and watched it again to make sure that I took all the notes on it because it was just I, I was so impressed with how well constructed at the right exact time in the match yes. to do that it. It was the peak for this. Toyota misses a top rope moonsault on Inoue. Underrated, uh, the Toyota moonsault. Like, it, and very different. It's hard to describe, yes. but it's, it's almost like it, the best way I could describe it is like when you see like um, BMX riders hit a backflip off of a ramp. That's what her moonsault looks like. Like one leg is going, the other leg is going almost like a scissor fashion. It's very different. Um, it does it, what it doesn't do is, is lend itself to getting a lot of distance. So the opponent yes. has to be near the corner, or like we saw on the floor, has to be near the apron. Um, so you have to be ready for it. It's it's different to take, I would imagine, than others, but it looks really cool. In a way, with a sit-out power bomb, but Yamada makes the save. Yamada gets hit with a spinning back fist by Kong. Kong puts her on the top, but Toyota pulls Kong off from behind. Yamada off the top with a kick, but Kong kicks out. This was another good near fall. Yamada and Toyota both miss top rope splashes. Yamada and Toyota are both squashed in the corner by Kong. (laughs) Yeah, they did like the, you know, the... The Steiner style, like from the, the Canadian backbreaker position, then you run your opponent into the corner. She did that to each of them, stacking them up. They counter a charge and put Kong on the top rope. Kong is able to knock Toyota off, but Yamada hits a top rope backdrop driver on Kong. Toyota, when she was knocked off, she fell right in front of Inoue. So she ties her up, keeping her from being able to make the save. And Yamada gets the pin on Aja Kong to to win the match. This was so much fun. What an awesome match. One of the best matches we've had in five seasons of doing this podcast on the free feed. One of the most unique matches, just an unreal pace for 36 minutes. That intricate near fall sequence that you described, one of my favorite things we've seen on any match we've done. Uh, on any show we've done. And then the finish was another one of, in a different way, uh, an intricate sequence that led to a fall, not the near fall. The attention to detail, like you said, in terms of where wrestlers landed, where that put them in terms of being able to make saves or not make saves or stop saves. 
Um, just again, like one of those matches that particularly when you look at the style that modern wrestlers do as we record this podcast, a match like this should be required viewing for how to do that style, but how to do it in a way that feels uh, chaotic and not overly choreographed um, and uh, the attention to detail that makes all the little things make sense. We love the little things here. And this was a master class oh. and just a reminder of how good uh, both all four of these wrestlers are. Uh, it's just it, what a what a reminder that uh, it, it, this is the kind of talent that uh, all Japan women had f- from the 80s through the 90s. Just absolutely incredible. Also, quick note on star inflation, which is something you and I talk about off air a lot of times. Yes. This match only got four and a half stars in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. How? Yes, <laughs> we do an entire different <laughs> podcast series on watching matches that were ranked four or four and a half stars in the 80s or 90s and what would the star rating be in 2024 yeah and i couldn't imagine what so i mean for me we'll, we'll you know we'll 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 talk about it here as we, we wrap it up uh, uh i'll talk about my my love of uh watching these joshi matches uh in 2024 we'll we'll get there but first what we do every every week here we talk about our favorite thing on the show and the worst thing on the show so let's start with your favorite thing on the show adam i mean the best match without a doubt is is the main event the match we just reviewed is incredible it's unreal my favorite thing though might be just the moment of uh of bull nakano and akira hokuto yes. staring each other down and while the match ended up being shorter than we would have liked and it's you know more a step on the road to whatever that story was going to be rather than the finish, just realizing that we were going to get the two of them face to face was, was probably my favorite moment. Nothing was bad on this. I mean, least favorite thing. I mean, and she wasn't terrible by the standards of everyone else on the show. Terry power was just, sure. you know, just sort of existed. Honorable mention for me to uh, Sakie Hasegawa's performance in the second match. Someone I've not yes. seen a ton of, but was familiar with the name. Uh, and it definitely made me want to see more of her matches. Those are absolutely the correct answers. And uh, yeah, I, th- what this does for me is uh, continue to put me on the YouTube rabbit hole of watching. Uh, you know, we, we talk about not having a ton of free time to watch a lot of wrestling, right? You and I are, are watching uh, at least two shows uh, a week for this podcast. We've got all the stuff we watch for modern wrestling. You have your own Japanese wrestling podcast. Uh, so we, we, we watch a lot of wrestling. <laughs> and so uh, we don't have a ton of time to to casually watch uh, stuff in our spare time. But when I do, I think the thing I'm going to turn to is more 80s, 90s Joshi. I oh, think that absolutely. is that is how I'm going to fill my time because uh, holy cow, is it so much fun. I'm never disappointed. It's just like I learn new things I didn't know I loved, and I, I experience new new wrestlers, and and I, I experience uh, wrestlers that I know I love, like Akira Hokuto, doing more of her things as well. Just just tremendous. Yeah, one hundred percent. It's maybe even more than than All Japan Pro Wrestling, the men's promotion. It so far in this podcast has been the most reliably great thing that yes. we've watched, and so yeah, looking forward to uh, hopefully uh, whether it be this season or future seasons, or over on the bonus feed, the the randomizer or the intentionalizers bring us more all Japan women. If you want to know what we're watching, uh, what we're reviewing on this week's free feed as well as this week's bonus content, you got to make sure you're following us on all the social media platforms at Wrestle at Random. That's Instagram, X, Twitter, Blue Sky, Threads, we're everywhere. You can follow us there at Wrestle at Random. And of course, uh, the YouTube channel is a, way, is a place where you can watch the video version of this podcast over uh, search for Wrestling at Random podcast and give us a like, subscribe, do all those things to help us work the algorithm so other wrestling fans can find the show and we love to interact through the comments over on the youtube channel as well we've got a whole community going over there and we love to hear from you and your memories and your favorite things on these shows as well so make sure you're doing all of that over at the youtube channel and our social medias Uh, make sure you're subscribed to the audio version of this podcast as well on any podcatcher of choice tell your wrestling fan friends about the show and if you want that bonus content, we mentioned it earlier, patreon.com slash wrestling at random. Over 150 some episodes you haven't heard yet. 
And uh, if you're new to the free feed as well, uh, all the free feed content is evergreen. So that is new to you. You can go back and listen to any of the episodes in the past five seasons of Archives we have. And with that, we're going to wrap up this week's episode. Adam, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, All Japan Women. Thank you, Randomizer. And yeah, we'll see. Uh, will it be as much of a home run for us to watch next week or will it be something really weird and bad which will make for a great podcast too? Either way, come back next week. Thanks again, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk to you again next time.